Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming in. So my name is Sadiq. I'm working for Red Hat as a cloud success architect. This role involves helping customers design, build, and deploy OpenStack cloud successfully. So today I'm going to explore the anatomy of Neutron from a troubleshooting point of view. So a brief agenda on what I'm going to talk today. So I'm going to explore, I'm going to take real life examples to show you how to explore the anatomy of Neutron and to show you how we can troubleshoot a Neutron problem. The first problem is related with Neutron security groups. And the second problem is a failure to get a DHCP IP address from Neutron DHCP server. And third problem, random failure for connect, while connecting to Neutron floating IPs. And uh, finally, the fourth problem, communication through provider networks are very slow. And it's not working at all. If it is very slow, that means we cannot use that. And finally, I will cover some of the lessons learned during the troubleshooting. So before I start, I just want to set your expectations right. So uh, we are going to explore a limited anatomy of the neutron. There is, the time is not enough to explore the entire neutron anatomy. So I will explore the anatomy of neutron that is related to the problems that I'm going to speak. Then uh, these examples are real life examples. And uh, the, the problem and the solution that I'm going to explain are specific to the version the, where we, we hit the problem. So today, if you go home and try to reproduce that using the Newton version, you may not be able to reproduce that. So your focus should not be on the problem and solution, more on exploring the understanding the anatomy of neutron and try to understand the troubleshooting steps that we followed so that you can solve a similar problem in future. So let's go ahead to our first problem. That is, uh, neutron security group rules are not effective. So the problem is that I created a neutron security groups. I also added some rules into the neutron security groups. And I created an instance using that security groups. Then when I tried to reach out to the instance, obviously the rules that I specified for SSH and ping are working, no problem. But the problem is that all other rules are also, all other network communication to the instance are also working. So this means the security group rules are not effective. And obviously the first step, I'll try to understand whether uh, it's a problem in the way that I created the security groups. I tried deleting the security groups, creating a new security group, and attaching to the instance. And finally, uh, just try to attack the default security group where everything should be blocked. There is no luck. Whatever I do, everything to the instance is allowed. I can ping SSH. If I bring up an HTTP server, I can uh, access the port 80 of the instance. So here, the problem starts. Try to understand why every, sec every rule is working, even if I have defined the security group properly. So the first thing is just try to understand where exactly the security group rules are applied. If you have explored the anatomy of a compute node specific to that instance, you first need to go, through, go to the uh, Nova side and get the name of the instance. Then you need to understand where exactly the instance is running on which compute node. And then try to get the port details for that instance and get the port name. And you, you, uh, you, the, the port name, then you, understand, you get the tap interface associated with that port. So the communication from the instance uh, comes directly into the tap interface. From the tap interface, then it goes through a Linux bridge. Then it, get, it goes through the uh, BR in OVS bridge on the compute node. So the first thing, you get the tap interface, wh where exactly security groups rules are expected to be applied. Then you understand how the security group rules are applied. So I have uh, one another slide that explains the, the chains, each and every security, the packet goes through when it reaches the tap interface, when it comes to the IP tables chain. So the first thing, every packet to an instance enters the forward chain. Then from there, the packet then moves into a neutron open view switch a forward chain. Then it again, the, the, the packet that are 
expected to be for the instance go through neutron open with switch SG chain. So this may be, uh, this might have some changes in the neutron in the flow, but uh, this is the flow when we really troubleshoot the problem. So then from there, it, it identify the incoming packet using the minus minus fist dev in rule, then it moves the incoming incoming packets into another chain, and it moves the outgoing packets into another chain. So the packet that reaches the incoming chain, so this incoming chain is where exactly the security group rules are entered. So you will see a security group rule for ping and SSH to allow ICMP and SSH access inserted into the neutron open v switch hyphen O XXX chain. From there, the packet checks, but then, then the, the target for that rule is return. Return means send the back, packet back into the previous chain if it matches the rule. So if it matches, then it sends the packet into the previous chain. From there, it again goes through other rules in that chain. If there is any, if no, the default policy is accept, then it will accept that packet. If it is no, then it goes to another chain called a neutron open with switch SG chain, where the default rule is dropped and the packet will get dropped. Same is true for the uh, outgoing packet. If it, if it meets the return rule, then uh, it is accepted, you know, then it is dropped. So our, we are trying to understand, I explained to you, the packet need to be inserted into the new, I mean, the rule need should be there in neutron open with switch or XXXX. So yes, the rule was there. The rule was there in that chain to allow ping and SSH and, and deny all other uh, packets. So can, can we have the questions in the end? No, it's, it's, the O is incoming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had the confusion. I had this confusion, so I confirmed that. Thank you. So um, the rule was there, but still, th those rules are allowed. But again, everything else also allowed. So this, also, we tried our best to understand the rule is there and everything, but still there is no solution. So the next thing that we try to do is do IP tables logging. That means you can add this rule into any chain. That means then you see in your warlog messages what are the packets going through that chain. Then what, what uh, uh, depending upon the rule that you have created, it will show you details of that rule. So in fact, we try to do this and we do not see any logs in var log messages that, that is pointing to the packet that, is, uh, that we sent to the instance. So this clearly says the packets are bypassing the IP tables. It never goes through any of the IP tables chains. And this led us to investigate further and see what are some of the global parameters that may be available in the Linux kernel which might bypass the IP tables change for a packet for a Linux bridge. Then we started hunting for that parameter, then we found that there is a parameter, net bridge NF called IP tables. If you set it to zero, then all the packets will bypass the IP tables chain. So this was exactly the problem with the deployment one of the customer did, because the deployment tool, when the, the compute node was provisioned, automatically had a kickstart post, which sets this value into zero. So you will not be able to reproduce this in the latest version because then in Newton or in Mitaka, Nova dynamically sets this value into one when, whenever you start a first instance. By passing or overriding the value that you might have set during the deployment. So that was our first problem. So I hope you will be able to troubleshoot security group issues in future. Hope. So let's go to the second problem. So that is the DSCP IP. Newly created instances cannot get DSCP IP addresses. The problem is that there are a lot of instances that created previously, 
And if I try to renew the DSCP lease, or if I try to reboot them, they are successfully getting the DSCP lease. But if I launch a new instance, it does not get the DSCP IP address. So the first thing that we did, we tried to explore how DSCP is configured in this environment. So in this environment, uh, DSCP is configured with DSCP agents per network set to three. That means for each DSCP neutron network that you are going to create, there will be three DSCP server instance running in active-active mode. For, uh, assuming that there are three different network nodes, DSCP agents running, it will create a DSCP server for that network on, on each DSCP agent. So, so the beauty of DSCP server is that the high availability for DSCP is built into the protocol itself. So that means you don't need fancy tools like uh, Pacemaker or Keep LIVD to, to manage the high availability of the DSCP servers. So how this works is, suppose an instance is trying to get a DSCP IP address. It first sends a DSCP discover packet, and this is a broadcast, and all of the DSCP server will get that DSCP discover, and all of them will respond with a DSCP offer, and the client has, client then uh, chooses one of the DSCP server to get the IP from, and sets the server identifier into the packet header, into the packet, and sends, uh, replies with a DSCP request. All of the DSCP servers will get the DSCP request, and the server which has the identifier set will only respond with a DSCP ACK. Others either does not respond, or uh, they uh, respond with a DSCP no ACK. That means, finally, the instance will get the DSCP IP address only from one of the uh, DSCP server. This is not uh, something OpenStack specific or Neutron specific. This is how Neutron works even outside, uh, DSCP works even outside of the OpenStack or Neutron in a, a physical deployment as well. So first we understand, uh, we try to understand this. So if you try to TCP dump each the DSCP server, you will see the flow. It, it's receiving the DSCP uh, discover and offer and then request and there is no response. Only the system which has the DSCP identifier, server with the DSCP identifier response with the, uh, with the ACK. So once we understood this, then the next step is we try to identify the layer two flow between the instance and the DSCP server. So DSCP server is running on the um, network nodes and uh, the instance is running on the compute node. So from, uh, from the, so the first thing we tried to do is try a TCP dump on the ETH zero of the compute node and see what, what things we are seeing here when, when the instance requests a DSCP IP address. We can only see the DSCP discover. Then here, so, so that means we don't need to do anything here because all the, all, everything is all right here. Then we try to do the TCP dump here and we, see, we only see the DSCP discover, nothing else. So that means the tunnel is fine or the VLAN communication is fine. Then finally, we try to do the TCP dump on tap XXX. We only see the DSCP discover, nothing else. So that means the layer two flow is good and the packet from the instance reaches the DSCP server on all the servers, but the DSCP server does not respond with any offer for the newly created instances. So this uh, helped us to focus our troubleshooting on the DSCP server set and try to understand where, how the DSCP server is working for Neutron. So obviously, this is the, this is the, this is how the DSCP server works. On, for, for each network, on each DSCP agent, it's going to spawn a, a DNS mask process with a host file. This means this host file has the IP address and MAC mapping for each instance that is going to be created. And the DSCP server is configured to respond only for those instances. Any other request it comes into the DSCP server will be dropped. So we, we explored this file 
And we see that this file has entries only for the previously created instances or old instances. And newly created instances does not have the IP address and MAC address mapping in this file. So, good. This led us to investigate the next stage. Who is responsible to update this file? So this means, uh, actually, the ACP agent, through the message queue communication, it is responsible to update this file. And then we tried to dig into the DHCP agent logs, and we see a lot of entries like no queue DHCP agent in we host for this uh, uh, in all of the DHCP servers. This means when we uh, further investigated, this means there was a disconnection between the DHCP agent and the message queue, but the specific version of the DHCP server agent was missing the code to reconnect in this specific scenario. That means it got completely decoupled or broken from the message queue, and it didn't update the, uh, update, uh, the, the host file for any new instances got created. So the immediate solution was to simply restart the DHCP agent. We could have done this in the first stage itself, but if we do that, we could have missed the entire troubleshooting and and the backporting the patch. As a permanent solution, our developers backported the patch from the upstream version that automatically reconnects if, if there is a disconnection. Good. So this is the problem with the DLCP agent. So let's get into the, get into the next, pro next problem that we have, that is connection to floating IPs randomly fails. So if something is working, I'm happy. If something is not working, it's still OK, because I can go ahead and troubleshoot. But think about a scenario. It works for some time, and it does not work. After some time, it again starts working. Then it stops working. So a random failure is really painful to troubleshoot. You have to get to the bottom of, of, of this to troubleshoot this. So let's, uh, so, so when, when our customer reported that they have a problem, random failure while connecting to some of the floating IPs, we tried, first tried to understand how Layer 3 agent is configured in this environment. So in this environment, the layer three, configure, layer 3 agent is configured to spawn three uh, routing, uh, uh, I mean, neutron router instances for each router. So this means L3HA is configured to true, and the min, ma maximum L3 agents per router is set to three. That means if there are three network nodes, then uh, we are going to have three L3 I mean, routing instances for a specific router. So once uh, a, a, a router is created, it will have a default gateway IP from the uh, private network and a gateway IP from the public network. And this IP is going to be active only on one of the instances, routing instances. And the other instances are running as passive mode. If the primary instances goes down, the keep LAD is responsible to move the, the the gateway IPs into the other instance and uh, make the routing and floating IPs working again. So we, tr we first tried to understand this, and then a VXLAN tunneling is used for uh, network node and instance communication. The floating IP here used here was a VLAN provider network, ex VLAN provider external network. Then finally, let's try to understand the and explore the anatomy of how layer 3 agent works. So what you see on your left side is the communication on the compute node. What you see on your right side is actually the anatomy of a layer 3 agent for a router on the network nodes. So as I explained, there are three network nodes. Each of them are going to have uh, the the QRYYY is going to hold the g default gateway IP for the private network. And the QGXXXX is going to have a base IP from the external network, plus all the floating IPs on that. And this IP is going to be active only on one of the nodes. If this node goes down, the IP will fail over to the QRYYY and QGXXX of the other node. And the HA port is actually responsible to keep the heartbeat communication between all the nodes uh, for keep LAD. And uh, it sends the VRRP and makes sure that the other node is up. If the other node is down, if the heartbeat is missing, then the IP will fail over to the one of the other node. 
So in this case, we verified that one of the node has the IP address. It has all the floating IPs and the private network gateway IP. And let's go to the next slide. Let's uh, try to take only the active, the anatomy of the active node. And the active node has BR int, and the external network communication is between uh, int BR EX and uh, PHY BR EX, and connected to BR EX, then it is zero, then to the external network. So this is uh, how uh, it, it was configured using provider networks, provider external networks. And so the first thing we tried to do is try to ping the default gateway IP from the instance. It's working. There is no packet drop. It's 100% successful. So that means the, the communication from ETS0 all the way to the QRX access is successfully working without any issues. Then we tried to the ping the base IP of QGXXX. No problem, this is 100% successful. So there is nothing wrong in the anatomy from here till here. Then the next thing is we did inside the namespace, we tried to ping the default gateway that is, that is configured in the external network. So when we tried to ping that using IP NetNS, EXX, Q router, then ping the external gateway IP, then we are successfully able to see the random failure. It works, 10 pings works, then 5 pings does not work, then 25 pings works, then 50 pings does not work, something like that. It's purely random. So we got an area to focus. We need to focus here to troubleshoot this further. And so, I mean, this is what I just explained. So the, the important thing that we try to do here is, this is an OES bridge. And if we do the OES app CTL FDB show BREX, we see the port how the switch learns the instance MAC address and to which port it need to be sent the packet. So we see this, we kept a watch on this, and suddenly we see when, when the instance ping stops, the port number, port, I, I, uh, ma, ma, port and the MAC mapping suddenly flaps into one. So this again, we only know why it happens, I mean, what happens, but we need to find out why the flapping happens. So this again, uh, so first need to understand what is two and what is one. So for that purpose, you go and run OVS CTL, uh, OVS OF CTL show BREX. So this means one is ETH zero and two is PHY BREX. So if the instance has successfully work, the MAC address should be mapped into two because that is the route to reach the instance. If it is it is zero, the packet goes out. So it never reaches the instance. So, so then we try to uh, run a TCP dump on the it is zero interface. And interestingly, we see the, that everything that we send out, we see a duplicate request, be it ping or whatever it is. But so suppose this is an ARP request that is going through from the instance, then see we see immediately see two ARP request, one reply, two ARP request, one reply. This, this goes on. So then, then still that, that's what, that, that clearly says this is a loop from the switch, or a loop from the external network. Whatever you send through the ETS zero, it comes back into the ETS zero itself. So just because of that, the OVS bridge learns that this MAC address is outside of the bridge. Okay, then it, according to that learning, it changes the MAC address and port mapping. So then way it works, if you go into the instance, you straight ping outside, again the OVS bridge says this is coming from, from the instance inside, coming through the PHY BREX, then it again learns that the packet is inside, then flaps the port mapping. Then again, loop comes in. It, it changes the port and IP, MAC mapping. So this is the root cause for this. Uh, in this specific case, we had to 
get this resolved from the switch side or from the hardware side. There was some misconfiguration of, uh, I mean, I told this ETH zero, but in, in, in that exact case, it was a bond zero, LSCP bonding, and the LSCP configuration was, some, there was some mistake in the configuration that was done on the switch, and, and the packet was looping through the slave interface. So this is an important point that you can do. Enable debug logging uh, within the OVS, specifically in the VLOG set of proto D DPIF X lab debug. So you will exactly see that what happens inside OVS. It clearly says, learned, learned that MAC address is on port ETH1. And when the flapping happens, it clearly says, learned that the MAC address is on PHY BRAX. So this is uh, really important. So the, tough, the toughest job here is to prove to the network admin that there is a loop. They always think uh, my, my system is working perfectly without any issues. So you will have to have a lot of uh, research, TCP dump results, that, uh, and send to him and convince him that there is a loop if you want him to look at the switch side. So that was the toughest job in this case. Because this also in involves LACP, because uh, the LACP is not configured properly. And uh, there should be a lot of problems when you co configure with bonding. So let's, uh, let's go into the next problem. That is the communication to provider network is very slow. This is, again, one of the painful things to, to troubleshoot. So the important thing first you need to understand how the provider network is working. So let's go into, uh, jump, uh, quickly jump into the next slide. Where, so uh, uh, in short, the provider network is actually bypassing the neutron networking to some extent. And you are going to create an instance directly into the external network. And uh, the, the, the instance that is running on the compute node, the compute node should be wired into the external network directly. And it directly contacts the, contacts the gateway on the external network. So this means uh, this is the anatomy of a provider network looks like on a compute node. The packet comes all the way to the BR in from ETH0. Then from BR in, there is a patch pair connection between in BREX and PHY BREX. Then uh, it, all the, it all the way goes from BREX through the physical interface bond 0.301 or whatever you have configured. In this case, it's bond 0.301, then goes to bond 0, then through the slave interfaces, it goes to the external network. So let's try to understand how this was done here. So uh, uh, in this specific case, uh, the BREX is added into the bond 0.301, then it goes through bond 0, then the, through the slave interfaces. Then immediately, uh, this but the VLAN provider, then the external network was created using this command, which is a network type VLAN, and with a segmentation ID of 171. So you can smell what is the problem here. This was a user error, basically. Because we tried to first try to do a TCP dump, and we saw that the packets are getting fragmented completely in all the TCP dumps. So then we tried to lower the MTU on, on the instance to 1450, and we saw that everything is working perfectly without any issues. But is that the solution? Obviously, no. But this is not a VXLAN network. So VXLAN has an overhead of uh, uh, some bytes. So we need to lower the MTU. There is a non-issue that we can accept as a solution. But this is a VLAN network. So if it is a VLAN network, and if you are going to suggest that you lower the MTU, then you are missing the real problem here. So we tried to dig deeper on why, why it is not working with the 1500 MTU. We did a TCP dump. And when we tried to explore, when we analyzed the TCP dump, we saw that the packets are getting tagged two times. The tag is 171 or OK, the tag is 171. Then again, it is getting tagged with another VLAN tag. So the packet has two VLAN tags inside it. That means it always exceeds the 1500 MTU and causes fragmentation that cripples the network communication. And it
it makes the communication very slow. Then we try to understand why it is getting tagged two times. So this is where exactly you need to understand how the provider network flow works. If you create a VLAN, sorry, if you create a VLAN network, VLAN provider network with a provider uh, VLAN ID 171, then you need to, then you have VREX and bond 0 dot 301 and bond 0 configured to send the packet out of the external network. This means this, the, the neutron or all adds a f obvious flow within the BREX due to this rule saying that if a packet comes in here which has an internal VLAN tag, when, when a packet comes from BR into BREX there should be an internal VLAN tag. You strip the internal VLAN tag and add 171 to the packet. So you got one VLAN added. And again, you send the packet through bone 0 0.301. That means another VLAN tag gets added into that packet. That is a 301. Then it sends that packet into bone 0. But when it reaches the bone 0, it has two VLAN tags. So obviously, it's, this is the wrong configuration. So what is the solution, actually? The solution is uh, the, the internal VLAN tag is here. When it comes here to the PHY BREX, it strips the VLAN and adds the 301 VLAN. Sorry, uh, the uh, earlier comment I used 171 as the VLAN ID. Should, should have been 301. Then it goes through here, bond 0 dot 301, then bond 0. Obviously, a double VLAN tag gets added when the packet reaches here. This causes all the performance problems. And to make it working, you sh should have configured bond zero like this. You don't need to create bond zero dot three zero one and add bond zero dot three zero one. If you do that, then you need to recreate the network as a flat provider network instead of a VLAN provider network. If you want that, and configure it that way. But that is not a scalable model. So what we, this was a, a mistake or this was configured like this by a misunderstanding by our customer. So we rectified it. It was a simple mistake by the customer, but to get to the bottom of that, we had to spend a lot of time and efforts. Because you may see, you may see that uh, you should have first explored BREX and see how it was configured. It's not practical because the anatomy of neutron is too complex. You don't know where to start with. You may start from the wrong side. All the way you reach into the right side, you ha should have spent a lot of efforts there. So finally, some of the lessons learned throughout the troubleshooting steps that you can, you should be aware of that. Collecting the prerequisites to start the investigation to troubleshoot a neutron problem is time consuming and confusing. That means, obviously, if you have to get the instance name, you have to identify where, on which compute node the instance is running, then finally you have to get the ins name of the instance that it's being represented in your list. It's a different name than the instance name. Then you need to understand the port name, port number, port number, then the, in the internal VLAN tag used for the network on the compute node. Because the, the internal VLAN tag is going to be different for the same network on different compute nodes. Because that internal VLAN tag is local to that compute node. So this information, collecting this information, then you have to write it down completely. Then we need to apply value troubleshooting. Collecting this information is too time consuming. Then too many hopes to run TCP dumps for troubleshooting. So you don't know where the packet is going to, to fail. So if you start from the instance, there are a lot of hopes that you should, you may have to run TCP dump to understand where the packet is failing. That means if you work with a customer, you get a bunch of TCP dumps, 10 or 20 TCP dumps from different interfaces, then you see where the packet is showing up, where it's not showing up. This is a big effort. Uh, sometimes the understanding the OVS topology is time consuming. Uh, there is a tool to, to, to mitigate this. I forgot the name of that tool. I didn't get search in, it was time to search for that. So I, will, uh, I thought I will update this, this lane later on, but I missed that. So when you run this tool, it will give you a graphical overview of the OVS topology on, on the compute node and network node, that this is how the packet is expected to go through BRINT and from BRINT to PHYBREX and then all the way to the external network or things like that. 
So do not assume neutron is always wrong. Obviously, neutron is this part of this, and it depends a lot on external components like uh, DNS mask, tipal LD, and a lot of other things like kernel configuration and the networking configuration or open view switch. So, so your problem may not always be in the neutron. Your problem may not be deep in the kernel on open view switch or something external to your uh, your neutron open stack environment. So the another problem is hunting for expertise in each of them is challenging. So if you suspect that something is wrong with DNS mask, you need to find out an expert person who knows how DNS mask works. If you if suspect something is wrong with keep LFD, then you need to hunt for a person who knows how keep LFD works under the hood. So, so it's really difficult to build all the expertise in the same person who is trying to troubleshoot. So you need to reach out to different people to understand how things are working. And finally, when you troubleshoot Neutron, you should have to tread a lot of a wrong path before you get into the right track. So this is expected. You will foc first focus on the wrong area where nothing will be wrong. Then you finally isolate a lot of things. Then you should have gone through a lot of wrong path before you re reach the right path. And this is all I have for this session. And there are some interesting sessions coming up from Red Hat. So you are recommended to go through and unless one important one is that uh, OpenStack troubleshooting so simple even your kids can do. So if you are afraid that Neutron is too complex, uh, you, by seeing these examples, you are recommended to go there and, and watch that. It, it, they will make it easy for you. And finally, questions. I don't know how much time we have left, but if there are some quick questions, I'll be happy to go through that. Want to use the microphone? So thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I'd, I'd be really interested to know uh, about this tool that you mentioned. Uh, so if there's a way that uh, we could perhaps uh, get a link to this, uh, this would be really valuable. Tools? Do you mean? Uh, the tool to uh, draw the, the the topology. This this would be very uh, very interesting. So, so I think actually I did. Uh, I'm using the Google uh, slides. I use the Google slides itself to draw that uh, topology. I see. Okay. I didn't so use like any any other tools. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So I think I did the same thing uh, like Google Draw. In Google Draw itself. Yeah. yeah. This is exactly what I yeah, did. So I thought if there was an automated tool. Uh, no, no, there is, uh, the, the, there is no automated okay. tool. I, I draw this manually using the Google Draw. Okay, understand. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Excuse me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just a little quick. Uh, thanks for the interesting session. So I'm curious about when you do the troubleshooting. Uh, besides the OBS, do you try any other, you know, virtual switch like Linux Bridge? And, and how would you see, is there any difference between the Linux Bridge and OBS in the, you know, uh, real-world environment. So uh, I, I remember use, uh, using Linux Bridge in the Grizzly and Havana. After that, I have never had any any problems being reported, or I have not seen too many customers reporting problems with uh, Linux Bridge. And when it comes to so so our focus is completely on uh, OBS and and the native ML2 driver for this talk. And when you come to the other plugins, third-party plugins, there are a lot of plugins which I don't have any exposure into troubleshooting them. So, so we, we actually usually collaborate with those people uh, like Nuage or whoever is uh, providing that uh, plugin to, to do the troubleshooting. So we, specifically the Linux Bridge, I think for the last two years, even I haven't worked with the Linux Bridge. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if there, are, there aren't any questions, I think thanks for coming in. That's all I have.